Thank you, students and teachers. And to just a few, let me say, Anastaline, Demana Drachu, Dananachu Woi. That's uh, a little bit of Amharic with an Aussie accent. <laughs> let me uh, read two verses uh, from First Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, like perishable things from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without defect, and without spot. Because I have a very limited time in Ethiopia, of course, I never preach for less than two hours, but uh, time is limited, so let me just tell you a brief story which will illustrate those verses. Um, probably most of the Ethiopians whom you meet, you'll all find that they're all very uh, olivey skin. The Ethiopians that I worked among were much darker than that, quite brown or very dark black, lovely blue-black color. All Ethiopians, no matter what tribe they come from, no matter what language they speak, and there are many languages in Ethiopia, at least 70 main languages, uh, they are all very friendly, very hospitable. They would never let you go past the door of their house without inviting you in and giving you something to eat or drink. Years ago, not that very long ago, I was trekking down in southern Ethiopia, where most of the Ethiopians you uh, have met have never been. We uh, worked, uh, well now, I went out in 1954, so the years have gone by. And I've been uh, living there along the great Omo River. That is O-M-O, -O, not blue-white power charged or biodegradable, but it happens to be the biggest river in Ethiopia. Some of the Ethiopians think uh, the biggest river in Ethiopia is the Nile River, the Blue Nile. Well, it's the longest, but it's not uh, uh, the biggest. Some think it's the Wabishabeli or the Awash or one of the others, but uh, the Omo is really the big river which flows down into Kenya, and um, it is full of crocodiles and hippos and Nile perch. And uh, if you can land one about 150 kilos and cut them into three-inch steaks, you'll know what I'm talking about. That is fish. However, along that uh, river, on both sides of the river, live many different tribes. Until a few years ago, no missionary, no white person, no explorer had ever been into the Tsara tribe. And uh, very few people have ever heard of the Tsara tribe. But we met. My wife is a nurse, and uh, she was having a little clinic away out in the bush, and there was a little short man. He came there, and through an interpreter, he, uh, I asked him where he came from, and like a good Ethiopian, he pointed with his chin, as they do, to the mountain some distance away, and I said to him, is it far? And he said, oh, no, it's not far. If Ethiopian says it's not far, be prepared to stay a while. 48 hours later, I arrived up over the mountains, down in the valley on the other side, over several mountains, through the rainforest, very thick, large trees there, and through the plains where the grass grows to 12 or 14 feet, three or four meters high. And eventually we came to a clearing in the forest, a large area, probably about the size of your school grounds here. And in that area, there were three villages. All those people do not live as the main Ethiopians live. They live in tiny little grass humpies that you have to get down on your hands and knees to crawl in because the doorway is only about that high, 60 centimetres high. And those people I found living in three villages, there were about 300 people all told. I thought at the time they were all the Tsara people. I found out later that there were many more, but
But all those people in those villages, 300 of them, were all slaves. Let me just say that officially there is no slavery in Ethiopia. It was done away with a long time ago. But in very isolated places, there is still serfdom. There is still, well, some of these things. So I found out that in this clearing of the, with these three villages, their the one man owned everything. He owned all the land. He owned all the forest he claimed to. He owned all the animals. He owned all the people. He lived in a huge house, half the size of this auditorium. It was round. It had high walls and a, a door that I could walk through. It was beehive shaped, made uh, beautifully uh, thatched with grass. Beautiful uh, air conditioned house. And so um, uh, I had to go and uh, greet the man who owned everything the landowner <coughs> or the slave owner, if you will. So as I came to his house, he very kindly came out to greet me, and he turned out to be a very kind, a very benevolent dictator. And uh, he ushered me into his house and sat me down on a little low three-legged stool not far from the door. And then he talked to me, and we talked in Amharic, and uh, we, uh, while we were talking, uh, we could hear the women out the back lighting fires and uh, uh, starting to uh, roast the coffee beans and uh, getting things ready to prepare a meal for us. And uh, while we were talking... This man um, suddenly <laughs> clapped his hands three times, just like that. He wasn't applauding me. I, uh, I hadn't said anything spectacular. Nothing happened. So after a while, he did it again. Still nothing happened. But after a while, when he did it again the third time, he called out one word. Bari! The word for slave is baria. You cut off the ya, you finish up with bari. And so they don't have any barias now, they have baris. And almost uh, immediately after he called out that word, there came running through the doorway a little dark boy. He was as black as charcoal, that beautiful bluey black color. He was only about six years of age, I guess, and uh, he didn't wear any clothes. It was pretty hot down there. Um, and uh, as he uh, came running through the doorway, he suddenly froze in midair because he saw for the first time a white man, a white man he'd never seen before, and one with red hair. Twas. And um, absolutely scared out of his wits, he hit the ground as gravity took over and he turned to run. He was absolutely frightened, scared, terrified of me, never having seen a white person before, didn't know that any existed. And so it was as he turned to run, his master called him again, Bari, and the boy stopped, turned around and slowly made his way past me in a circular way around till he stood behind, beside his master. And his master spoke to him in the local language. I didn't know what it was, but he was giving him instructions. The boy never heard a word that he said. He, his eyes were this big, staring at me and wondering who I was, where I'd come from, and what I was going to do to him. He didn't know whether I was going to spit roast or take him raw. He thought I was going to eat him, I'm sure. Anyhow, finally, his master clipped him like that, and he finally got the message, and he went out the same way, in a circular way, until he came opposite me, dashed out the door, and was gone. After a while, about five minutes or so, he came back in, in, in carrying in his arms a great wooden bowl, about that big. And he was carrying it, it was fairly heavy, and as he approached me through the door, he got slower and slower 
and slower, and his arms got longer and longer and longer as he approached me. And finally, he placed the bowl at my feet, and he turned and he ran. He came in again next time, carrying some nice, clean pieces of wood, which he also placed down and ran. The third time he came in, he came in carrying a gourd, a calabash shaped like that, and it was full of cold water. And then he put that down, and keeping as far away from me as possible, he knelt on the ground. Now you know what he's going to do, don't you? He's been told to wash my feet, of course. Well, I took pity on the boy. He's frightened, so I took off my trekking boots and took them aside, and I took off my socks, and he stared at my feet, and I pulled my trousers right up to my knees as, remember, I'm sitting down. That's the customary thing. And very slowly, the boy reached out, and he took my right foot in his hands. Now, I, I don't mind people washing feet, my feet. I've done, had it done hundreds of times, thousands probably, and uh, I don't mind washing somebody else's feet. It's the custom in that part of uh, Africa. So, uh, and I have eaten all kinds of strange foods that some of you perhaps have eaten or haven't, and uh, <clears throat> you don't mind doing that for Jesus' sake because it was the Lord Jesus who sent us into this area where the people had never heard any of the Bible stories, where they'd never seen a Bible, never seen a book of any kind. And here we were doing the right thing. So the boy picked up my foot, placed it in the bowl, poured some cold water on it, and went to, uh, to work on washing my feet. As he washed my, uh, my foot, he rubbed all the way right up to my knee, I'm sure he was trying to rub that white stuff off to get down to the real colour. But anyhow, he rubbed and rubbed and rubbed. And finally, when he'd finished, he put some clean water on it and then placed my foot on one of those clean pieces of wood with my toes sticking up in the air while he <clears throat> went to work on my left foot. And he did just as good a job on the left foot as he did on the right. It was wonderful. And uh, we'd been walking for two days, so and it was very hot and dusty, so... I didn't mind having clean feet again. And there my feet <clears throat> stood uh, up there on the drying in the air while he cleaned away the dirty water and the good and so on. And then he came in again. <clears throat> I was busy talking to the master, the owner of everything. And as we were talking, I wasn't really observing what the boy did. And he just came down and he knelt where he had before. And all of a sudden, he reached forward and he kissed the big toe of my right foot. Now I've been to strange places and I've eaten funny food and I've observed all kinds of queer customs, but there's one thing I have never, ever been able to stand and, or tolerate, and that is that anybody would think they were below me and would have to kiss my feet or my knees, as some tribes do. I've never allowed that to happen. And now, for the first time, after all these years, it's been done. The boy had kissed my toe. But as a slave, that was the right thing for him to do. Well, I reacted quickly, and I grabbed the boy. And boy, if he was frightened before, now he was really scared. He was terrified. The sweat was pouring off his face and he was shaking all over, but he jumped back and the only thing I caught was his chin. I caught him by the chin and I lifted him up to his full height and now we're eyeball to eyeball and I pull him towards me and he digs in his heels and he's trying to get away and I pull him towards me and now he knows, he doesn't know whether I'm going to sprinkle salt on him first or just take him as he was. <laughs> but as I pull him towards me, I say one word, and the word is lije, which means my son. And I kissed him on both cheeks. And I let him go. The relief washed over him. 
He didn't run. He just stood right there. He'd been holding his breath for about a minute and a half or two minutes at that stage, and all he could gasp out was the word, Abba, Abba. Father, my father, he was a slave as his parents and his grandparents were slaves. And that little boy, somehow in his mind, he recognized what I had done. He was a slave washing my feet and I had picked him up and I had made him my son. He didn't need to fear. We were in a new relationship. He wasn't a slave and I some big shot. He belonged to me and I belonged to, to him. From that time on, during the week or more that we stayed there, that boy never let me out of my sight. Where I went, he went. When I sat down, he sat down. Where I slept out in the grass because it was very hot at night time, he slept alongside me. When I ate, he ate. And when I went down to one of the villages to tell the boys and girls and men and women about the Lord Jesus and how he came and how he, the miracles he did, the wonderful things he said and how he died on a cross and how he rose again from the dead, that little boy was always with me. He was usually walking alongside me and he used to slip his hand into mine or hang, hang on to my little finger. We were in a whole new relationship. I redeemed that boy. What does that mean? I paid a price for his freedom. I didn't tell you his name, did I? Would you like to know his name? Well, I, I'm not going to tell you. You see, his name was an awful satanic name given to him by a witch doctor. And I have never used that name. I've always called him Lije, my son. And he never learned to say Mr. McClellan. That would be quite a mouthful for most Ethiopians to say. He always called me Abba, my father. And the years have gone by, and that boy, I know time's gone. Can I take a minute? No, Let me... go. Give you three to go. I, um, the um, time, time has gone by. The government changed in Ethiopia, and uh, the man who owned everything, the slave owner, was eventually assassinated. And his wife was taken, who lived in the house, and made that beautiful, those beautiful meals for us. She was sent into exile, into ex internal exile in Ethiopia, four days walk away from Tsara, and never been allowed to return. And when she went, she had a little bundle of clothes and things to carry, and a little dark boy offered to carry them for her, and he went into exile with her. They were taken to a town and in that town, there happened to be a school. And eventually, Lije, the, the boy, was able to go to school. He had heard the gospel during that week or so, a few days longer, that I was there in those villages. And he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his saviour, as did his mistress, and in that town, they started a little prayer house. And they invited people to come to their house where they boiled coffee. And when in Ethiopia, they always boil a big earthenware pot uh, of coffee. And they usually put some salt in it and some butter. And down in the southern areas, they put red peppers in it. And then, of course, they invite all their neighbors in to help them drink it. And they usually need some help. And... Um, Anyhow, in that way, they were able to share the stories about Jesus that they had heard. And eventually, some of those people believed. And in that town today, there is a great big church as big as this one. And out in the villages around there, there are many more churches. In fact, there are 45 churches in that surrounding area that have come into being through the witness of that boy my son, Lijay. 
He was redeemed. Jesus Christ, God's Son, died on the cross, shedding his blood to pay for our redemption, that we might be free, that we might be saved. The big question is, have you been redeemed? Have you been redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus? Thank you.